Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 1, where you're finally on to the next season, guys. Season 2, Episode 1, titled The Prodigal Son. Now, we are splitting this into two episodes for our, just like we did for the pilot. So we're only going to be covering the first half of The Prodigal Son, which, when the show went into syndication, they split into two episodes. But when it first ran, it was just one single long feature length episode. It originally aired on September 27th, 1985, and it's directed by Paul Michael Glazer, which, guys, you may remember, he was director behind Caldon's Return Part 2 and Smuggler's Blues. And I think there's a lot of similarities between those two episodes and this one. Paul Michael Glazer is also yeah. the guy who played Starsky and Starsky and Hutch. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah. And so John, like... I sound, sound like he has something on like that, that this episode's very familiar plotline to Caldon's Return Part 2 and the Smuggler's Blues. There's a lot of crossover there. I was just going to say I thought it was interesting that Pam Greer got a director's credit mm, in this interesting. episode as well. Huh, I have a lot more so, to say uh, on her character from this from this episode. In particular, a question of how? How, after murdering someone in cold blood, is she still working <laughs> vice? But... <laughs> the vice? The, uh, the sometimes Jamaican tubs make his way from New York to Miami with, you know, no paperwork, no questions asked. He just transferred. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> At least she got put on probation, and they moved her away from situations where she's more than likely to kill someone. <laughs> well, Jenna, you touch on something that I thought was interesting. I- I'm starting to question whether or not tubs actually work for the New York Police Department. <laughs> I think he just lied on his resume because no one seems to know Tubbs there. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's in his home police station and and, and and no one's saying hi to him. What's coming over? He's like meeting up with any buddies or anything. Even Pam Greer is ignoring his phone calls. <laughs> This episode was written by David Pine, who is actually the executive story editor for the show. He wrote episodes under a pseudonym, H.A. Edison, including Out of Darkness, Little Prince, Rites of Passage, and then in the future, definitely Miami Yankee Dollar and Trust Fund Pirates. So a well-versed showrunner, show writer, showrunner, writer who's written, you know, this. Uh, these two guys are, are vice pros. Before we get started, we'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, it's Christmas season. No matter how much you fight it, it is Christmas season. And we all know my opinion, and I'm not afraid to admit it. I am not the Christmas spirit type. Christmas is weird. I don't know. Well, I'm like, I'm outside of that age where Christmas is like fun and exciting and not yet to the point like where you are, you've got, you know, kids that are waking up early and excited to do all that stuff. It's pretty much just like a normal month at our house. (laughs) The biggest... You see, for me, professionally, my job is somewhat seasonal. And so I'm usually have the least amount of money around Christmas time. And and then, but I also have the most free time. So Mm -hmm. it's a very strange time for me because i uh, suddenly i have more free time but i, have I, I don't no have money. any money to do anything <laughs> yeah no means to be able to go do anything <laughs> you're like the reverse yes. season of a teacher although this year i actually did plan a trip and so in fact next week i will be flying to kansas city to watch a kansas city game at arrowhead on thursday night nice that's nice. Cool. That's the you're Thursday night game your, against the Raiders. You're going to freeze your butt off. Yeah, and it, it's looking like it might be a snow game, too. So, uh, I mean, this is like bucket list. <laughs> Checking off something on my bucket list for me, being able to see not just the Chief game in Arrowhead, but a snow game against the division rival. This is going to be huge. Well, I can't say that I'm not jealous. So, let's, let's go and talk about some more jealousy between Tubbs and Valerie in this week's episode. All right, guys, so we get started off very strange, actually. We start off in Bogota, Colombia, and we're just like, they're, the duo is with a, uh, a man named Drummond, and they're hauling ass through the jungle in Colombia, and Drummond, who works for the DEA, is giving them a rundown on what's happening around them. He's taking them out to a spot where the military have captured someone who works for the Ravia gang, uh, who, which is why the duo is down in Bogota to find out when the plane is leaving from Colombia to Florida to find out more information. And and I say it's strange because it it lasts so it's so short it's straight to the point and there's no ex, there's no real reason why 
the Miami Vice should be following things up in Colombia. Yeah, there's absolutely no reason why they should be there. And very quickly, it just seems like they were driving around intentionally trying to be kidnapped <laughs> uh, in the jungle. <laughs> like, it just seems like, like the just... DEA had it under control. Why did the Vice team have to show up there? Why are the Miami Vice part of the DEA? Like, they're constantly brought in as though Bogota was, like, the part of their jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they they worked the Vice in Miami and all of South America. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, their territory. <laughs> man, budget cuts have gotten drastic. <laughs> Can I point out that after they get, I guess, kidnapped, it, you realize that, man, they are extremely overdressed for stomping <laughs> around in the jungle. <laughs> well, I will say, Sonny looks amazing. We're back in the season two. His hair is a little longer. He's his suit is great. He looks amazing. Tubbs is Tubbs. He's just kind of that's just the way he always is. But Sonny, Sonny's looking sharp. And they eventually, I don't know if they get. I think they were supposed to get captured. That's what was supposed to happen because if they they get stopped by the military, t- taken at gunpoint. Drummond tells them just cooperate and keep your hands up. They get taken out to a to like a structure, some sort of structure. And in there, the military have someone from the Revia gang tied up and they're torturing him, trying to get information out of him, including an old school hand crank electric motor to shock the the prisoner which i have to say is very inventive i wonder what catalog they got that out of that you actually hand crank the your, it's a hand crank torture device no electricity needed bring your own probably in one of those uh magazines that you read on the airplane <laughs> <laughs> Of course, when they get in there, Tubbs, you know, he's a- very anti-torture, as we've seen in pre- previous episodes. So he kind of gets in a little skirmish with the with the military guards a couple of times. I will say that the general or whatever, the field general for that branch of the army there, he's like the Colombian Harry Carey. And he just kind of stands in the back watching <laughs> over as his men fight with Tubbs. And Tubbs so, is so, like, so, crazy glasses on. <laughs> yeah. They, like, eat uh, his tiny, tiny face. <laughs> You know what he reminded me of? That woman who used to do the Gap commercials who had, oh, like, yeah. like, the absolutely gigantic glasses. I guess it's needed for a military, for a war. That way you can see things really far away. <laughs> yeah, except they look what? like those glasses that you can buy on, like, the As Seen on TV that yeah. channel stuff where it's, like, the... What like C in HD? <laughs> they, have that, they have like this special sheet on them. They're like kind of orange. <laughs> Eventually, Tubbs is able to talk to the prisoner, and he finds out that basically he gets a code from the prisoner. He says, we find out a little bit later, he says the cross of Jesus. And then the military pushes after a couple of little small fights that break out between the duo and the military there. They get pushed out of the structure. Then you hear the military shoot and kill the man that they had tied up. And then we go to our so opening just, credits. Just real quick. Was I mistaking or did after the little scuffle Tubbs had with the guard, did that guard try and crank the, the box real quick while Tubbs was touching the guy? Like the <laughs> I'm so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna shock you ass, bitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was almost like that brace the military runs their own prank YouTube channel and they were trying to get tubs while you were touching them. <laughs> when we when we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the precinct. So we make a, a very quick jump and, and the from precinct. Columbia to the precinct. Yes. And everyone at the precinct is standing around looking at the ugliest wallpaper in the world. <laughs> I don't even know how they read that map. It's just this lime green with some green <laughs> lines in it. I don't even know how they're able to read it to be able to tell where they're supposed to go. But this is but where I think that... We can... We can agree that it's a step up from the chalk drawing <laughs> that we had in season one, right? Like, they're at least now <laughs> printing whatever it is that they're hanging up on that board. But yeah, clearly it takes the entire squad to interpret this thing. Apparently it didn't, actually, because Sonny stares at it, says that the code was the cross of Jesus, and that he remembers talking to a Colombian pilot that was able to say that he said one time that his drop point was called Christ Crossing. So Sonny basically figures it all on his own. No need for a trip to Colombia. No need for a map. Just needed the DEA to ask the guy and that they had captured in Bogota what the what the words were, and then call the Miami Vice team and tell them the words. Like you could have cut that whole trip out and just let the DEA ask the question. Just ask Sonny. Apparently, he knows where it is. And this is just one many unnecessary scenes to make <laughs> this an extremely long beginning of the second season. <laughs> 
Yeah, they they use this information to pinpoint somewhere out in, I don't know if it's the Everglades or if it's like how far away it is from Miami, but there's some drop point that they've figured out where it is now based on these code words they got from this guy, plus the code words that Crockett knew from his previous contact with a Colombian pilot. We jump to the swamp or the Everglades, wherever they are, and the vice team is staking out like, did they just, did the Colombians just crash the plane at that location? You would think that it would be an actual I drop, but instead the plane's just sitting in the water. Are we sure that that Colombian oh. pilot wasn't Jimmy? <laughs> A.K.A. Glenn Fry? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Crockett still keeps up with him on the side. You know, he yeah. calls all the time. He's just Sometimes he's Jimmy something. gets worried. He wants to make sure everything. Aren't you is excited safe. though, John? Aren't you excited though, Jenna? We finally got it in an airboat. Yeah, we have yeah, multiple oh, yeah. airboats. More I airboats was... than the than the whole, all of season one in this scene. Yes. <laughs> finally. And, um, so the, the whole vice team is there, plus some Miami regulars, some Miami PD regulars. And you could tell who was good at hide and seek as a kid and who wasn't. Because there's some of them who were just sitting in their boat out in the middle of the water. So the vice team has been sitting out there. They're, they're, they kind of knew a time when the Revia gang was going to show up. And that's who they're after. As we mentioned, when they were in Colombia, the duo was there to find out more about the Revia gang. When the plane was going to take off from Colombia and come to Florida. Which, I guess if they were in Colombia, they could have stopped it before it left but let's just wait till it gets to the u.s i guess and then find out uh when, when to go make a bust on it there are like the whole team's there they're just hanging out there they're two hours past when the drop when the pickup time was supposed to happen castillo's just about ready to give up he tells them that they're gonna wait a little bit longer but there was a time limit for when the revia game was supposed to come pick it up and just as he says that, of course, three airboats show up or two airboats show up to come do the pickup. And that's, you know, like, like John mentioned, like there are many, many airboats in this episode, in this scene, because there's like three for the vice team and two from the Revia gang. And this is probably the best it's ever going to get, Jenna. It's awesome. This is pinnacle <laughs> Miami Vice for me. We've made it. <laughs> oh, they're either unloading or loading drugs into the plane. I can't tell because it looks like, like all, all you see is like they're passing each other back and forth the same bag of uh, <laughs> white powder um, and then we see our first I guess guest star in Luis Guzman Yes. Who's hopping around uh, yes, looking and rather he's paranoid. One of the Revia brothers. His name is Miguel Revia in this episode. And uh, as true to Luis Guzman, he is a god on and off screen who refuses to die. <laughs> of course, when so, the vice team see the boat show up, within just a few seconds, of turning, they turn the lights on and then begins the massive shootout over the airplane. If they have just their for our lucky viewers, police it, alligator. Yeah. <laughs> just Go for ahead. our listeners' knowledge, Luis Guzman, also known for... For Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Traffic, and just about a dozen other movies, and including a number of comedies. Including guest appearances on uh, one of my favorite TV shows, Community. <laughs> There's even a statue of Luis Guzman at the college in Community. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there really? Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So he intrigued. also, Jenna likes, uh, uh, I know, likes the movie Waiting. He's also one of the chefs, one of the line cooks. In that movie. Yeah. Of course, in true Miami Vice fashion, there's a shootout, and the Miami Vice team basically kills every single person that they were trying to arrest. Basically undoing everything that they were trying to do. They just flatter everyone who's trying to make the pickup, and they have no one to talk to to find out more information about the Revia gang. The only person who doesn't die is Miguel, or Luis Guzman, who falls into the water, and then they don't notice that he doesn't die. He's just hiding out in the Everglades. But I do have a question. If you're an actor on Miami Vice, and you're supposed to pretend to be shot and then dive into the water, would you be willing at night in the Everglades to just jump into that water? Uh, absolutely not. In fact, uh, when the gunfight broke out, my note was, man, the gators are going to eat good tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I would trust the Miami Vice crew as much as the uh, like the on-screen crew in terms of will they keep me safe? <laughs> yeah. Odds are, Based on production no. qual qual uh, quality, would you uh, really trust that crew? <laughs> I guess if you're a red shirt, 
you know, it, it, it depends on what team you're on. If you're a red shirt, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't jump into that water. They may, they may be fishing you out later. <laughs> uh-huh. So when we leave after the, the massacre of the Revia gang and they're not able to get information, we go to a, uh, the vice team is all going to a party. Someone who works for the DEA is named Henry. Uh, and as they're, as the duo is driving up and in their Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as the vice team is driving up in their Ferrari, as, Croc is driving up in his Ferrari. They are talking about how the party seems to be out of the income range of Henry. That's and that's that's pretty ballsy to say as you're driving around in your Ferrari. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, this guy might be dirty because he saved up for a nice restaurant. Now, excuse me while I park my Ferrari, one of my <laughs> many Ferraris. <laughs> yeah. And as they're walking in, they also see that the B team is arguing with someone at the restaurant because the bug van has gotten stuck in the uh in like the drive-through kind of valet area. Which by the way, Zito is sporting a fantastic beard. Did they really drive the bug van to a nice dinner? <laughs> I mean, like, really? That is that the only car that they have? The they, bug they van don't also have got car? a sweet paint job too it looks it's like lime green with some like scratch marks in it now and stuff like i if, if there was so, ever a thing i could say is mountain dew extreme it's that bug van <laughs> I, i'm just curious so Crockett makes enough money that he can own Ferraris, um, even with his child support and spousal support he pays every month. Yes. And yet the B team makes so little that they have to drive the bug van <laughs> around, um, which is is their work vehicle. I mean, well, let's be real. Crockett has paid... Crockett hasn't paid a dime. His his supposed child and ex wife are in Georgia, and they are poor as dirt, and he has completely <laughs> forgotten them. <laughs> it's all you that kibble that's... he's got to buy for Elvis. He's got right. investments he's got to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> so they go walking into the restaurant or bar, or whatever it is, and Trudy's waiting for him at the door. And then they go walking in, and right before they get to the door to go into the party, they hear gunshots. So, and this is this is one of my favorite moments. They hear gunshots. They go to, and they they Crockett turns to Trudy and says, "Go get help." And then Crockett and Tubbs kick in the door and go try, and they end up getting a shootout with one person. They kill one person from the Revia gang. The other person is Miguel Revia. They shoot at each other a few times, and then Miguel gets away. But my favorite part here is that they turn to Trudy and say, go run and get help. It's like, wait a minute. Isn't Trudy a fucking police officer? Like, <laughs> why did they? Gina was already at the party. She's inside. And but then they turn to Trudy. It's like, get out of here. Run. Run for help. Uh, <laughs> like, wait, but she's a police save officer. Save yourself. <laughs> like, yes. Trudy can't get well, obviously any they... respect anywhere. <laughs> no. No, she can't. So, and man, damn, these Colombians are like roaches, man. They're just everywhere. Yeah, they're inside. They kill a whole bunch of people inside of the party, including Henry. And then Crockett finds Gina, who has been shot, laying on the floor. And then she says she's cold. And then Crockett puts his jacket on her. And uh, and then we end that scene. We go over to the hospital. And and I actually thought Gina was, was dead at this point. Yeah, yeah, I thought like, oh man, this is this is one of the vice. It's we're due for a vice team member to die. It feels like, and, and then this is the one. Yeah, and then the next scene starts, and it's how the next scene starts that really made me start thinking, like, oh my god, Gene is dead mm-hmm. because they're all because they're sitting in this hospital room and all of the beds are made up there's no one in the hospital beds. Then they're, they're so just it's in like, an empty room. Yeah, they're just in an empty room, and it's like. Like, did they take the dead body out already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this- you know, like you got that, and they don't address her until the end of the scene. They don't yeah. mention what she's in surgery until the end of the scene. So it's yeah. this very somber scene where you think that, like. Oh my God, Gina's in the morgue, and they're all just kind of shocked. Yeah, yeah, they're out, they're over there plan- planning their revenge against the Revia gang. But you're right, Swiatek comes in at the end and says Gina's out of surgery, but she's still in critical condition. So it's not clear. Although we don't ever revisit through the rest of the episode, or sorry, through this part, they probably revisit it in the second half of the Prodigal Son what the status is of Gina. But in this episode, we don't we don't find out any more information about how Gina's doing. But in yeah, this I would hospital, hope scene, that they would reference it mm-hmm. in the second half. But has Trudy come back from getting help yet? (laughs) (laughs) Look, okay, you guys, we need to talk for a second. They need to keep Trudy as safe as possible because she's the only one that knows how to work the computer. Okay? (laughs) If they lose her, they lose 
all access to information that isn't on a printed one of those like library cards okay and even then it's shot to the because, chalkboard odd, yes odds are tubs doesn't know how to work the fax machine either okay it's just it's so bad that like Trudy, run get out of here real police officers need to look, need to investigate this it's just it's just so bad but in this in this hospital scene the d there's a da agent and he what he's saying this is in a real important scene actually he's saying that the Rabia gang has found out they had a way that they found out all of the information about the dea agents that work in new york city their names their addresses and so they're all in hiding they're all in protective custody with their family so the dea doesn't want to put any of their own people in harm's way and they're asking for the miami vice team's help because they're dealing with the with the Rivia gang in miami too because that's where the drop point is that they send a couple of vice officers up to new york city and go try and infiltrate the Rivia gang to bring them down and the reason why they would do that is just not just because they have experience oh. with the Rivia gang but because no one in new york would recognize them including a former new york police officer right yeah but hold on we don't know about New York and the very important scene after the hospital on Dean Simmons' kiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just before we get there, just to acknowledge that that's why the vice team is, that's why the duo is going to go to New York because they are unknowns in New York. They're going to go up there, even though Tubbs used to work there and his girlfriend lives there who works on the New York City vice team. They are, un- apparently, they are unknowns in New York City and are going to go try and that, that's why they're going to work for the DEA inside of New York City. So they were already plan. See, I, I missed a little bit. They were already planning to go to New York before Gene Simmons told them to go to New York. Yes, they actually use they like like uh, confuse Gene Simmons into inviting them to New York to go sell their drugs there. Okay, so his scene was even more useless than I originally <laughs> thought. Yeah. <laughs> so, but his so, hair was great. So, <laughs> well, let's let's it. get to that scene. Welcome to the Kiss Yacht. <laughs> I am Gene Simmons of Kiss. <laughs> I wish they had made him do something where he had to show his tongue. Yeah, I know. They would have like, worked like an in some missed. kiss branding into it. Like but... some sort of weird kiss or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, like with where like were like they like everything the in that scene. Like, oh, the honeys. Yeah. The honeys. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like everything that in that scene has like a kiss label on it that uh, <laughs> Gene Simmons owns. And so yeah. like he makes like 35 cents every time that episode is shown. So he, <laughs> hey. he made like a dollar fifty off of us today. Tubbs and Crockett come pulling up in Crockett's boat and they're going to another boat. They're going to the yacht and they're going to go talk to Gene Simmons. His character is Newton Windsor Blade. He's a dealer that Crockett's been working for like three years. And... <laughs> Such a bad name. Wait, wasn't wasn't Hulk Hogan's name Blade in that movie last that we watched last in night? Santa with muscles. I think so. His name was something <laughs> like that. Like Blade yeah. Johnson or, or something. <laughs> they come pulling up, and on of course on the deck of the boat, there's all kinds of women dancing. There's music playing, which I'm sure John, you will talk about that song that's playing as they come pulling up to the boat. Yes. We'll save that for the music segment. And then uh, they board somehow, and we jump to. Which I had written down at first. I didn't realize it was Gene Simmons that was playing that was playing Newton. I wrote down. I was like, "Is that Polly Shore?" <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so messed up but i had my own moment like that i'm gonna save it for later but because we're about we're about to get there but yeah <laughs> anyway. and they basically work an angle with with newton they say that they have 600 kilos of cocaine they got from the revia gang it was it was due to go to the police after the bus but it somehow disappeared before it ended up in police lock up and so Tubbs and Crockett have it. I forget what their what their names are. Burton and something. Ernie? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for that. I was like Burton and Ernie. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so they they basically work around to like that they want to move it but they can't move it in miami there's too much on the street already they want to go somewhere like the southwest or the midwest newton says no you should i can only help you out in new york city you need to go talk to jimmy borges in new york city he'll be able to move it and the duo kind of and you like, have to oh, let me put a kiss sticker on it 
Okay, but so, here's how you know that his advice is legit. He recommends a Jimmy, okay? <laughs> Jimmys have been the most helpful people in the entirety of Miami Vice. They fly planes, they serve you your breakfast, they know how to like how to get everywhere, they have all the right information, fly they know planes, all the right people. They know people in other countries, you know, right. like everything. They'll protect like, you in a shootout. The only thing that they don't do is own hot dog stands. And even then, <laughs> I'm pretty sure <laughs> they must have a stake in it somewhere. And I'm pretty sure this Jimmy's a hot dog enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the other. <laughs> the other thing with Gene Simmons' character in this scene is that he like goes in and out of doing like some sort of Jamaican or Haitian accent. Like sometimes he does it, and, and like one line he does it, and one line he doesn't. So it's really hard to follow. Like, where are you supposed to be from? Are you New York? Are you from Miami? Are you some? Are you like Dominican? I don't understand what what your character is here. I can't tell by the hair and the fake spray tan that you have. <laughs> okay, so let's jump past this completely useless scene, uh, especially since we will not see Gene again, at least in this half of the episode. No, and we have a we have a montage. We we jump straight to New York, and we have a montage, which made me very dizzy as it panned from ground to the top to l- looking up at the skyscrapers. This is, I think, just stock footage that they have from any person, like any Midwestern person who's ever visited a city, because it's just a bunch of shots. Straight up. Look at how tall the buildings are. And then look at the people. Look at how tall the buildings are. Like, it was very disorienting. (laughs) And at the end of it, we end up at the New York precinct where they're trying to arrest the Blue Man group. (laughs) (laughs) It was... The show was definitely trying to be very new york right like trying to play to all the stereotypes of new york you have a a lieutenant who's like no nonsense immediately starts calling out the vice team there's like some weirdo off the street spouting end of the world stuff who's painted himself blue but we meet lieutenant pierce yeah who's that that hard-nosed lieutenant that you're talking about right he's played by charles dutton which we can get into because charles dutton's been in some good stuff and i know that you guys are are excited about a couple things a couple projects that he's been in this is a really (laughs) short scene in that they they the lieutenant saying he's not going to cooperate crockett makes a phone call who then talks to like the police captain of new york city who's he's just really quickly says all right fine i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna have to be forced to work with you but in the background there's tubbs is trying to call valerie because they're back he's back in new york city so he's trying to get a hold of valerie and he's like calling a bunch of different phone numbers trying to get a hold of her and this is the scene right where he tells the person on the other end of the phone that his name is tubbs and then he like he describes how how to spell his last name and i forget what it was that he said on how he did his like oh, basically call I've, sign i've got it it's a tough unique bad bold and sassy sassy <laughs> sassy <laughs> It's so tough. Can't you imagine him hiking up his jacket and sticking his butt out and walking? Like, after he says, <laughs> after he says that? I, just, like I, I need we, to come up with the same thing for my last name. Now, my last name is nine letters long. So... <laughs> it's so, going to take a little while to pass. So, you gotta, you gotta ask the person first, like, do you have five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> When we leave from the precinct, we go and we go hold, down hold, the street. Hold, hold on, wait. Yeah. Uh, I just R, want to point out Robert again. Oh, as in oh, is that Robert Loja? <laughs> 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 All right, I, I just want to point out one. It seems like. Uh, the way the police chief is acting here in New York, like, once again, it brings up, like, did Tubbs actually work here? And then the the other thing is that, man, why is Crockett such a dick to every other uh, police agency out there? Yeah, he refuses to basically work with anyone, right? And then uh, and then also, like, yeah. no one recognizes Tubbs. He is a... He is yeah. a a man that doesn't exist in New York City. And as you mentioned earlier, like, was he a cop in New York City? Yeah, I just, I mean... Did, did he did he work in another borough? It just seems very strange that no one seems to pay any mind to him. Like, like he's never been here. And he doesn't seem too familiar with anything there either. When we leave from the, the precinct, after Tubbs stiff arms the Blue Man group into submission, we jump down to the street. And this is when we meet Jimmy Borges, who is played by the Pendulette, uh, who's also rocking 
the sweetest mullet I have ever seen. I mean, it's this man so owns good. the mullet. I love that he's able to do so much with the curly hair. He leaves the the front like the bangs, if you will, <laughs> just, uh-huh. just free and bushy and wild. But then he tames the rest of it. Like there's just so much gel happening in that that I can't imagine that he like on a strong windy day, nothing's happening there. <laughs> yeah i know especially since he just kind of rocks the um ponytail for like the last 15 20 years yeah, Do you think yeah. That he straightens his hair every day now or that he gets it chemically straightened because man <laughs> it is in the in this episode <laughs> But I, I don't want to make too much of the scene other than just how amazing Penn Jillette looked. Other, the only other thing that happened here is that they follow him down to a diner. Eventually, the duo is able to convince him to help them move these drugs on the street in, in New York City. The duo's whole goal is to rile up the Revia gang. That way, they can then make a move on them. They're going to use Jimmy's connections to go talk to people on the street to see if they can move the drugs. And then they will be able to start working on the Revia gang. Eventually, Jimmy concedes he'll take 50 kilos in pain for his help because he's like basically semi-retired uh, and he says that he'll meet them at club delirious at 10 o'clock and so let's just get over to club delirious because there's some great stuff that happens uh over at the yeah. club so just real quick it is very strange seeing pen without teller <laughs> um I, I keep waiting for teller to pop up which is like his sidekick uh, in the episode he keeps him in a bag happen. carries him around uh, do you think that he's pulling like an mm-hmm. izzy and he he's actually somewhere in the back of the scenes like he's yeah, just walking he's, like yeah. d- ducking between buildings so that he can't tell uh, but he, he's gonna get he's well, gonna just, get a credit on this just uh, by proxy you know and then the other thing that popped into my mind with Penn Jillette was, I wonder if working with Don Johnson's what pushed him to uh, get into magic. Like, <laughs> I can't take this acting stuff. <laughs> Screw it. I'm going into magic. <laughs> yeah, and this was Penn Jillette's first, first on-screen performance. And it's the same thing with uh, with a lot of people, with a lot of the guest stars in this episode. It's it's kind of there. They cut their teeth again on my device. Like Luis Guzman, this was his first appearance on TV. You know, and it just continues to be a trend where like people just start out on Miami Vice. We go over to Club Delirious that night and it's it's a it's a hopping club. And as the duo comes walking in, you see, of course, when Crockett enters a room, all the ladies are paying attention to him and he catches eyes with a woman at the other end of the bar, but she disappears and you kinda think like maybe he knew her, maybe he doesn't, maybe you know, uh, uh Crockett just kinda we all know that he ha- he gets that kind of attention when he walks into a room. Uh Jimmy's there with them and he's taking him to go meet Frank Sacco. And who's there with Frank? Damn. Valerie. Yeah. <laughs> She's there. Like they Tubbs and Valerie lock eyes as soon as they come walking up. And Frank even she notices it. Unhappy. Yes. Just so unhappy which i mean who can blame her like she's probably only now starting to forget how horrible the sex was <laughs> and i swear to god she she did everything to try and get away from tub she gave him a fake phone number <laughs> and dodged in his halls ever since he got back to new york yeah and without a bill here apartments. he is yeah <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so noticeable that even Frank notices that it looks like, like, hey, you guys know each other? And they try and play it off, but I don't think they do a very, very good job of playing off that they don't know each other, especially when they go dance and Tubbs is like just trying to undress trying to, and yeah, just trying to bang on the dance floor yeah, with Valerie. He was trying to swallow her face. <laughs> It's what he does so well. <laughs> there, I, I, it, it's just funny to me that the that the drug dealer guy doesn't think it, it it's strange at all. And they go out to the dance floor and, and Tubbs, like uh, who's supposedly a stranger to her, uh, is basically trying to throw down with her. You yeah, know? yeah, but and I mean, then like at the bullshit. end of the scene, they clearly make it uh, obvious that Pam is pretending to be like a love interest to this uh dealer but the dealer doesn't seem to really care because he calls he calls uh valerie and tubbs bookends tubbs is practically sniffing this guy's hair he's leaning in so close that i think he was just hoping to pass him off on somebody and that's exactly what happens right there tubbs is doing the negotiation with frank Frank says, you two look like bookends. You and Valerie should go dance. So they go dance. So he basically, Frank basically says, like, I don't want to do business with 
Tubbs and Valerie go dance. Um, and of course, we already mentioned like their Tubbs is like assaulting Valerie on the dance floor. And Frank tells Crockett back at the table, like, look, like I have too much weight already. I'm not interested in moving your guys' product. Um, I'm sorry. I can't help you. In the meantime, Jimmy heads over to the bathroom and he gets followed by a couple of, uh, couple of guys and we end up finding out later that these two guys work for the Revia gang and they start making there's a brief stopover when we leave from this club where Jimmy's talking to Luis Guzman or Miguel they talk to him and then and the Revia gang is telling Jimmy like make sure these Americans aren't able to move their drugs here in New York um, so so Jimmy is backed into a tough spot now where he can get paid for moving the drugs whereas it was supposed to be a quick deal but now the Revia gang is stalking him making sure that he doesn't set up any deals for the Americans yeah so he's kind of stuck playing both sides at this point after Tubbs and and Valerie are done dancing. They come back to the table with Crockett and Frank. And that's when Frank says, I'm going to take off. I have business to attend to. But he tells Valerie to stay and have a good time with the guys. So Frank takes off. And then Crockett also takes off. Tubbs suggests, like, hey, let's go party. We'll end up north of 132nd Street. But Crockett's like, I'm going to leave you two alone. You guys have a good time. And you see the look on Valerie's face like, no, please don't. Please don't leave me with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, like, like Tubbs meets up with Valerie and suddenly he's like, hey, screw working. Let's go party. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett leaves. Valerie and Tubbs are, at, are left at the club. And then we have this Crockett montage where he just goes on a stroll over in New York. And, like, he gets, like, the stereotype typical stuff that happens to him where he gets like harassed by some prostitutes he fails to hail a cab he's just smoking standing on the street corner a la... basically he is very lost and he cannot find his hotel if his life <laughs> depended on it he's just wandering around brooklyn like where the fuck is this place <laughs> <laughs> While Croc is out just stumbling around, causing problems all over the streets in New York, back at the club, Valerie tells Tub, "Hey, this this can't happen. No, oh, I'm I'm deep undercover. I'm working. Me and you can't happen right now." And she leaves. And then so, we go back to Crockett still stumbling what, around. What I in New like York. about that, what I like about Pam and Tub scene is they they come in just as Pam saying, "I can't, I yeah. can't." And in my head, I'm thinking. What freaky thing did Grico just suggest that they do? <laughs> After Croc is done walking, he ends up at a club, which mysteriously looks exactly like Club Delirious. So did he just do one big circle and end up back where he was? Because he said he was going out to go do other things, but it sure looks like he's at the same place. And the same yeah. woman who caught his eyes when he first walked into Club Delirious comes up and talks to him. Yeah, and I'm she... pretty sure he just walked around the block and then into the exact same club or the club next door. Yeah, it was almost like, like guys, you know, I, I really don't like you, so I'm going to say I'm going out, but I'm really just going to go to the other end of the bar and just ignore you for the rest of the night. They're not going to notice. Uh -huh. Tubbs <laughs> is already trying to lick her chin or do something <laughs> fucking weird. <laughs> Well, I get it. I get it. Crockett goes outside and that whole walk montage scene was just so he could smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And then now he's back in the club trying to bang this blonde chick. Yeah, she comes out of nowhere and, and just goes uh, straight before the gusto, right? She pushes hard on him. He pushes hard back. And then he goes to leave and he goes to step into a cab. And then she comes up and talks to him again. And then he, they eventually get in the cab together, and then Crockett goes to her place. But she comes on really strong to him, which it's, at first seems like she's just a strong 80s woman, right? What then turns into, like, no, she has some sort of ulterior motive. Yeah, it just seems strange that she would... It, it, it's She feels like a plant in the episode, but at the same time, I just want to believe that Crockett just has that kind of game. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The next morning, Sonny wakes up, and the woman is gone. He's at her apartment where the woman's gone. There's people moving in art, and they're talking about Sonny sleeping on the bed. Some very sassy, artsy gay gentleman. Look at this fucking yeah. guy. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, look, he's... <laughs> He's awake. Should we play with him? No. <laughs> <laughs> we also see in a in a different part of town that Valerie's seeing Frank out to his limo. Then she goes walking away, and Tubbs is creepily hiding behind the building, like spying on Valerie. He's so legitimately just weird. Like, like he's just so weird. Yeah, Tubbs. What do you is want to bet that, that he's jealous actually, boyfriend? You know, you know when Tubbs went on that the vacation to go see Valerie shortly after. Uh, 
Pam Greer's episode, what was that, Rites mm-hmm. of Passage? Mm-hmm. I bet you that he just went up there. She didn't even want to see him, and he just followed her around town. Oh, like, oh he's so I creepy. bet you she didn't even know he was there. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know that I, f- I forgot about that that he that that was the storyline when he was away and maybe there's something happened when he came up there that we don't know yet and that's why things are weird between him and Valerie. <laughs> it got weird. Yeah. yeah. Maybe someone didn't follow the rules of the safety word. <laughs> and now here we are. They don't get along anymore. There's the, the last thing that's of importance, which is going to come uh, become really important in the, in the next half of this episode, is when Crockett goes to leave, he goes to get his jacket and his gun is missing out of its holster. So, which, nice job, Crockett. Again, of course, now your weapon is out on the streets in New York and who knows what crime you're going to be blamed for because you wanted to bang some hooker in New York City. If only we knew someone in New York's robbery department <laughs> that we could trust <laughs> to help us out with this missing gun situation. <laughs> Too bad we have no connection to the New York robbery division. <laughs> Just saying. The duo then goes down, they go down to meet Jimmy and Jimmy's telling him, like, look, like, the Colombians run all of this stuff. You, well, we're not going to be able to move your drugs. I don't know what you want me to do. I want out. They're able to convince him to take them out, take the duo out, and go see if they can move the drugs. If they upped how much they're going to pay him, they upped it to 100 kilos. So pretty much to, to describe this, th- this montage is basically j- they drive around asking people if they want to buy some crack. <laughs> and yeah. at the very end of it, they end up in some club. Like, please buy our coke. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and like, even the club owners are like, no, nah, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have. They cannot move it. They drive around all day. They can't move the drugs. They end up, which is mysteriously looks exactly like Club Delirious again, because apparently they couldn't find another set to make a different looking club. It's just at the same place. They uh, they try all day. They're not able to move it. Jimmy, you know, Jimmy's in a bad spot here because with the Revia gang threatening him to not be able to move it. So he's really not trying that hard. It was just a weird way that they ended it where they ended up on this scene where we got the point. We didn't need this extra scene to say that the Colombians controlled everything that people were afraid of them. We already knew that. So we like this. This is this was the third montage in 45 minutes. It was just, it's all time filler. It's starting to feel like they could have fit this whole episode into a single normal episode and not this extended run. Yeah, I just, like I said at the beginning of the breakdown, so many unnecessary scenes. They could have gotten through, they could have gotten the same information across in half the time. Exactly. And so before we, in the last scene, the last part that we're going to talk about for this episode, as... Jimmy eventually says he's had enough. Like, I can't help you guys. We're not going to move it. You guys are on your own. Tub starts to argue a little bit about Cro- Crockett's like, just let him go. He's out. And as soon as Jimmy leaves, that's when the New York City police come pulling up and do like a stop and frisk on him. And it's the lieutenant of the New York City, whatever borough that they're in or the district that they're in, telling them that, like, look, like you guys haven't had any luck. I don't know why we're supporting you. You guys are outside of my jurisdiction. We don't like that you're here. And you still haven't been able to do anything. So you guys should just leave. Tubbs is putting up a little bit of a fight. But Crockett's like, no, go ahead. Like, we understand. We'll, we agree. We're going to leave. And we find out that Crockett's got a new plan. His plan is to cut off the Revia supply and make them desperate to get their hands on some drugs, which seems like this should have been a no-brainer. Yes, you cut off the Revia supply, and then they would get desperate, and you might be able to infiltrate it. Why are you trying to compete with them? Why did we just spend this whole first 48 minutes figuring out how you're going to infiltrate the Revia gang when it literally is like you could have just cut off their supply? Which, by the way, isn't killing everyone on the plane in the Florida Everglades and taking those drugs part of their supply wasn't that cutting off their supply (laughs) is is the problem is the problem that they are in new york and they don't rent airboats on the hudson river is that the problem (laughs) so this is where (laughs) well this is where we're gonna cut it off we're gonna save the second half of this episode for next week up to now even though not much has happened, we have all of the setup for a fantastic close to this episode of The Prodigal Son. All of the setup has been made. We have Crockett's gun is missing. Valerie is working Frank Sacco, and they are the NYC vice team is working really hard to bring him down. He's like a kingpin inside of New York City. They're going to go after the Revia gang, who's making threats against their connections inside of New York. So 
all of the dominoes are set up and the effect is ready to be kicked off. So we, although there may not be much that happened in this episode, we have set up everything perfect for a fantastic second half. Let's get over and talk about the music. That's because there's a ton of music that happened in this first half. And uh, let's let's move over there and go talk about the music. All right, John, hit it up. You got you got an amazing amount of music from this first half with very little playback. You could probably fit all of these songs in a single two minute stretch for how little they actually played of the song. But there's a lot of them. Yeah. So basically, there are 10 songs just in the first half of this episode, (laughs) eight of them showing up like within a 10 minute period, playing like literally 15 seconds worth of each of them. For this week's music episode, I'm just going to try and touch on one thing about the band of the song, each of the 10. I'm not going to go too deep into any of them. I'm just going to hit one thing for each of them. Hit me with your best shot, John. I got my pillow ready. Fire away. So, (laughs) Billy Ocean. (laughs) Caribbean. Okay, the first song of the episode is Billy Ocean's Caribbean Queen. The Trinidadian-born Leslie Sebastian Charles is aka Billy Ocean, and the song title and lyrics were actually changed for each region it was released. Mm. So the song is in Africa is known as African Queen, and in Europe it's known as European Queen. In the U.S. it's still known as the Caribbean. So I don't know if that was just no. He didn't care about the U.S., but <laughs> I actually have a, uh, I actually am going to say one more thing about Billy Ocean. When I was a kid, I had a Walkman, and I didn't have very many tapes of my own, and so I had inherited several tapes from my parents, one of which being Billy Ocean's Caribbean Queen. And I have to admit, when I heard the song come on as they were pulling up to the boat and people are dancing on the deck, I had to fight really hard not to stand up and start dancing in the living room. Yeah, so I must have listened to that out al- this album over a hundred times as a kid because it was one of the few tapes I owned. <laughs> the next song that we have is Glad by Traffic. And so what I will say about the band is that the lead st- singer, Steve Winwood was in the Spencer Davis group with band member Chris Wood, who I mentioned several music segments ago as one of my top 10 rock flutists. <laughs> Both of which were in the band Traffic and also played in the Jimi Hendrix Experience Band. Really? Really? Moving on. Yes. Go rock flute. (laughs) See, you don't believe me with the rock flute, but there it is in the Jimi Hendrix Experience. John, I am making you up some stickers that just say like, hashtag go rock flute. (laughs) (laughs) That is going to be my mantra, man. I'm going to make that trending on Twitter. (laughs) Uh, I'm just going to start tweeting randomly about rock flutists. (laughs) A phone case that just says the flute is metal. (laughs) Uh, uh, Yes. So the next song is The Pleasure Seekers by the band The System. They are a synth-pop duo of David Frank and Mick Murphy. The two met because David Frank was the keyboardist of a ba- of a funk band called Clear. Mick was their manager. So one day, Frank is in the studio recording a song called It's Passions, which he was supposed to do with Madonna at, like, before Madonna was famous. Mm. But Madonna bowed out due to creative differences, and it turns out that... Mick Murphy, who was their the band cleaner's manager, actually could sing, and he filled in for Madonna, and that ended up being their first song. Wow! So Madonna missed out because I mean the system became such a huge band. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that wasn't a hit at the band's the system. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> So the next song is Like It Is by Aaron Neville. Aaron Neville, most notably for the cover of the song Everybody Plays the Fool, his 1991 hit, which I didn't know was a cover, So, but I do remember the song very well. And so it, he performed mostly with his two brothers in the Neville Brothers Band, 
And all three of his kids are uh, musicians that you've probably never heard of. The next song is You Belong to the City by Glenn Fry, who is the former Eagles member. This is during his solo career. And this is not the only song from this album that has been featured on the show. So we know Glenn Fry. Miami Vice was a fan of his and they used his music quite often. Yeah, they're very sad that they found his airplane in the Everglades in this episode, too. <laughs> We missed you, Jimmy. Yes. <laughs> yes. So Jimmy did make the episode, but just in the music part. <laughs> Many Rivers to Cross is our next song by Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker famously covering the song You Are So Beautiful in 1974. And yes, it is that Simpsons version that they, <laughs> uh, they touched on. So something else about Joe Cocker is they are number, he is considered number 97 on Rolling Stone's list of 100 Greatest singers mm. and his Beatles cover of with a little help from my friends was the theme to the wonder years. Oh, really? I didn't realize that was his song. Yeah. That's Joe Cocker. Next we have pride uh, by U2, which is pride in the name of love. And you know, that probably U2's most popular song, their most, uh, the, and I mean, this is during the their rise to popularity. Uh, yeah, it's it easily was one of their about, most recognizable songs. Yes, definitely, definitely. The song's written about MLK. It's obviously one of the most recognizable songs and ranks 388th on Rolling Stone's 500. 100 greatest songs list. I didn't realize that's what the song was written about. That's that's just kind of yeah, blew I my know. mind that that's what it's about. Yeah, it's about Martin Luther King. So, uh, mm. now you know. <laughs> so, the next song is Do You Believe in Love by Huey Lewis and the News. I love this song. So, I love this song too. And this is off of Sports. They're like biggest, most successful album. It was the number one album at its time. Some of its tracks were used on Back to the Future. Now, how they got their music on Back to the Future is what is interesting. Because the band sued Ray Parker Jr. for his 1984 Ghostbusters theme because they thought it was, they claimed it was too similar to their song. I want a new drug. Huh. Seriously? Okay. And they actually settled out of court. In the process of suing Ray Parker Jr. for the Ghostbusters theme, they interacted with the producers of Ghostbusters, which developed a relationship. Those same producers in their products in their produced Back to the Future, and that is what got them their music used on that movie wow yeah you know and i talk about huey lewis um in um in the most recent episode of this week in vice because they obviously for because at this time in set at w when this episode aired back to the future is number one at the box office and similarly Huey Lewis in the news, their song The Power of Love is, num is number one on the Hot 100 because the 80s was a silly time. <laughs> it was. <laughs> also, it was. the lyrics, I just briefly aside here since we're talking about music, the lyrics to Power of Love make zero sense in the, in the use in Back to the Future. Oh, I know. I know. It makes no sense so. why that song, and that song was specifically written for Back to the Future. It was not some other song that they from the album that they used in Back to the Future. A song was specifically written for that movie. Yes. So uh, you can thank Gray Parker Jr. for getting sued. Okay. So moving on, the next song in the episode is White Stuff by Fashion, which is a British new wave band who has previously been featured on music segments because they used their, their song several episodes ago during the first season. The next song, just to wrap up all of this, this entire music segment, is Good Night Ladies by Lou Reed, who is the guitarist and vocalist for the Velvet Underground and is accredited is credited for writing most of their songs. So <laughs> there we touched on all 10 songs <laughs> and uh, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully there are not 10 more songs to the second half of this episode. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is just the first half of this episode. We still have 45 minutes to go. Coincidentally, yes. I mean, and 
not unsurprising given that we've just gone through 10 songs, but this is the most uh, songs in any Miami Vice episode, beaten out only by the Miami Vice movie, which had 16 songs. So the whole movie, oh. the entire movie had 16 songs. This had 14 in total. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, wow. So there's still there's still a number to go. There's more than the average episode. We normally get like two, maybe three songs in, in an episode, and we're all, and we're gonna hit 14 on this one. So wow. It perhaps yeah, only yeah. makes sense when you learn that they made this episode, the entirety, part one and two, into a movie. Movie. True, because it, it is like a, it's like a full blown soundtrack. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's a lot of music there, and so John, I feel like uh, you can kick your shoes off and put put your feet up and relax Good after work. that. Uh, yeah, after all that research on that music. Thank you. <laughs> all right, let's head over and uh, talk about our closing thoughts on this. The first half, the first half of season two, episode one, the Prodigal Son. All right, Jenna, why don't you kick us off? What are your final thoughts on this, the first half of this of this fantastic episode? We haven't got to the fantastic parts yet, but what are your closing thoughts? So, I mean, I think in true Miami Vice fashion, this is big. I, I think bigger than they could manage. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in total, we had... As I, I had previously mentioned, the 14 songs, there were also 16 actors that received guest star credits on this episode. 16 <laughs> for the entire episode. <laughs> so um, I think that it's clear that that Paul Michael Glazer wanted this to be very theatric. He wanted it to be like a very big, he knew that Miami Vice was super popular and they wanted this like big bang start, but it also had a ton of like little hiccups here and there, which I guess if you like, like it worth a rewatch to see if you catch any of them, but um, where it's just like, if Tubbs has a phone in his hand and then in the next scene, he doesn't have a phone in his hand, but he's still talking like he's on the phone, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> um, but really what I want to point out is just what is up with disguises in this. So given that we have 16 guest stars, there's undoubtedly crossover, um, between season one characters and season two. We knew that throughout season one, we mentioned that a number of guest stars came back and not as their character, but as new characters. So Miguel Panero being one of them. So he mm -hmm. played Esteban Calderon and he also played Esteban Revilla, which was one of the brothers. But the mm -hmm. only way that he was, I guess, disguised in the Sonny Crockett uh, school of disguises was that he wore... <laughs> He wore sunglasses the entire episode. <laughs> and and Tubbs had no idea who he was. Like, they just, just played it off. I mean, clearly he's supposed to be a different person. So, yeah. But, like, it's just weird because I think Calderon was such a big part of learning who Tubbs was and, and introducing him to the show to have the exact same actor come back and play, like, some other Kingpin brother. Which is kind of like, uh, okay. So, <laughs> so I'm interested to see, I guess, how that plays out over the course of the season as we get more and more of the people who we've come to know as certain characters. We're undoubtedly going to come across a number of more Jimmys who just bring all of the relevant information. So. <laughs> well, I don't think I have much to add to that. You know, this is this was definitely I know we're splitting it up and we could have talked a lot more about because we know some big things are going to happen between now and the end of the episode. And we're kind of arbitrarily cutting it off here to, to split this in the choice because it's just too much for a single episode but you can see like all the big things that are going to happen and the big one that i'm following is that crockett missing gun story arc and what that's going to turn into because he is out of his jurisdiction and i have a feeling because valerie mentioned when they were at club delirious she thanked crockett for helping her get out of out of her scenario which by the way she only got probation for murdering someone in cold blood i mean i understand he killed her sister but that doesn't mean that you can go vigilante across the city of miami and go take out whoever you want to but apparently she got it all worked out i have a feeling that this crockett gun scenario is going to turn into that valerie's then going to have to bail sunny out because now they're in her jurisdiction so i'm really interested in see where that's gonna go but otherwise i don't have much to add you know it's this is all set up and i i just can't wait for the second half of this episode john what are your final thoughts yeah so jenna was touching on that it's clear they wanted to make a big deal out of this first episode why are they doing like the feature length movie style and then you know for me i just feel like we went through just a ton of 
filler in this setup that it's just it the second half of this episode better live up to all of that filler because <laughs> like like we touched on 10 songs five or six guest stars and it was all for relatively 16, not a whole lot um, 16 guest stars john that's in the total more. episode I, <laughs> I i just mean in the first half of the episode of what we've seen i think we're somewhere around six or eight so far maybe more yeah. but yeah so far in the episode we've gotten a lot of music and a lot of guest stars but we haven't gotten very far in the episode as far as i think as far as the story goes so i think it's going to be really interesting to see the uh the the turn i guess and whether or not it lives up to all this build up and the storyline just so you know dominic that i'm most interested in is trudy going to get help i think she's going to show up at the end with that help (laughs) and and that's going to be yes that's going to be the 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 thing that saves the day (laughs) Well, that's going to do it for us this week. And, you know, before we take off, we do have one announcement that we want to make. Um, Unfortunately, this is going to be the last time we're going to have Jenna on as an every episode host. Jenna's got some competing projects that are taking up some of her time. So, unfortunately, she's going to have to bow out as being here every week. She's still going to be here occasionally helping us cover Miami Vice. But this is our farewell to Jenna for being a regular host. Uh, we're going to miss having you around. Can we play the Gossip's Creek theme song? I don't want to wait. Yeah, I mean, it sucks, but um, but I'm still, I'm going to be back. So you guys haven't uh, seen or I guess heard the last of me yet. I'll be back to make fun of Tubbs, who I'm sure is going to get laid at some point in this season. And I'll be here for it just to let everyone know (laughs) that I'm still traumatized. We know one episode for sure you'll be here for, which is episode 20, Phil the Shill. I think it's 10 or 20, Phil the Shill. So we will definitely have you here for Phil Collins. Uh, Yes. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I'm going to miss you, Jenna. I'm sorry we had to fire you you uh i can't wait for you to come back so that we can fire you again um and i wish you the best of luck on your new bob the builder podcast Um, jenna jenna the builder yes only i can fix it everyone Keep a keep a listen keep a listen out. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's gonna so, do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we appreciate you listening. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. Share. Share us on Twitter and Facebook. You can find us on Twitter at go with the heat. Um you can email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Please tweet at us or email us, and we'd love to hear what your thoughts are now that we're going into season two. That's gonna do it for us this week, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. Bye. Thank you.